Hello, I'm Andrew McInerney, Artistic Director of the Studio de Musique Ancienne de Montréal. It gives me great pleasure to introduce these pre-concert conversations for our 2018 and 2019 season. I'm Edward Higginbottom. I've for a long time been the Director of Music at New College Choir in Oxford and worked in the University of Oxford in the music faculty. I'm Elizabeth Gala Morin, musicologist. I play the harpsichord, and since uh, 1980, I have been interested in the musical practice in New France. Dr. Higginbottom, you will be bringing to North America works by Charpentier and Couperin, very famous French composers. It is fascinating to see how their music traveled abroad during their lifetime and even across the Atlantic to New France. We have kept in Quebec a manuscript of a Regina Celli written out in Charpentier's own hand when he worked for the Jesuit College in Paris in 1689, and the Jesuits also had a college in Quebec at the same time. Even the native people sung Charpentier's music, such as a chanson des bergers from a Charpentier oratorio that was translated into the Abenaki tongue by Jesuit missionaries. This is fascinating. The piece of evidence I know best, and you know even better, is this Livre d'Or de Montréal, which is the largest 17th century collection of French organ music in manuscript that we have. And lo and behold, it's not in Paris, not in France at all, but there in Montreal. Yes, and I was lucky enough to discover it. Nobody knew it was there. And that music was played at Notre Dame Parish by a young Sulpician cleric from Bourges. As far as Couperin is concerned, we do not know of the presence of any of his major works in New France. But Couperin himself was surprised at the popularity of certain of his harpsichord pieces that became the themes of spiritual canticles and that are to be found in many books of pious songs from the 17th and 18th century that have survived in Quebec. And other Couperin themes have inspired a contredanse to be found in an 18th century manuscript belonging to an officer who fought on the plains of Abraham, as well as variations for flute or violin in another manuscript belonging to a Quebec merchant. But you also have seen how French music spread abroad already in the 17th, 18th century and even later on. Well, my story concerns these Couperin motets that have survived uh, in one single source and for many years were lost. And the story is rather complex but fascinating. The Count of Toulouse was one of Couperin's patrons. In fact, Couperin most likely gave him harpsichord lessons. The Comte was well known to be a very fine amateur musician and put together, with the help of Philidor, a wonderful library of music, many hundreds of volumes. This is in the very early years of the 18th century and including works of Couperin. And then as time went on, people went and came. This library descended in the family to Louis-Philippe, who at the restoration of the monarchy became King of France. And in fact, this wonderful library became a Bibliothèque Royale. Then, of course, the abdication in 1848 and the dispersal of uh, Louis de Philippe's belongings led to the sale of this fantastic library. And an important part of it was acquired by a great bibliophile called Frederick Ousley. He was um, a man of some means and was able to not only acquire this very important collection, but also set up a college for the support of English church music at Tenbury. This College of St. Michael's and All Angels in Tenbury became an example of what it really needed for the English church tradition to be revived. Alongside, of course, this revival, there was a fantastic music library in the college acquired by Woosley. But not yet these manuscripts that we're talking about. They came later. They came in the 1930s when through another book sale in Paris, it was seen that part of this library that Woosley had acquired had been acquired only in part. So Edmund Fellows, who was a great musicologist at the time, made sure that the right bid was put in 
And an important addition to the Comte de Toulouse's library found its way again to Tenbury. And there, amongst those papers and manuscripts, was Couperin's motets. And that's how they got there. And they were going to stay there forever, I suppose, until the college ran out of money and all its buildings and belongings were sold. So these motets we're talking about have now gone back to Paris. They're in the Bibliothèque Nationale, where they should, of course, be. Uh, they are French. But th this is a wonderful journey they've undergone, which is not only from Paris to Tenbury and back to Paris, but through various sales and through various accidents of sale. So my story is slightly different, but it's equally exotic as finding Paris music lending it. And it is in that, those manuscripts that you found the uh, incomplete Couperin Motet. How do you go about, in this 21st century, filling in the missing parts of a late 17th century work? Well, um, I was going to say with some trepidation, but in fact, I think one can be fairly bold about this sort of thing because it could never be said to be a definitive move. Anybody could have a go at doing this and make whatever bid they want in deciding what Couperin might have done. I suppose my objective is to have written something that Couperin might have done, but we can't be sure that he would have done, but it's reasonable to suppose that he might have done it. So the first thing you do is you look at other examples. Well, let me say first what we're missing. We're missing the two violin parts which go with these motets. Uh, they're scored for three and then one for single voice. So there are two motets, a trois, and one motet for a single voice. But in each, there should be a trio of uh, instruments, two violins and a bass. We have the bass, but we're missing the two violins. There are other motets of Couperin where those violin parts exist, and you look at those and you form an idea of how he goes about scoring such pieces. That's the first thing you do. And then you have to make a decision about at what point in the piece the violins really do need to be there. And that is pretty clear when nothing else is happening. If there are no voices singing, then there's got to be some violin music going on. So that was easy. When the voices are singing, there are times when the violins probably don't play, when the voices have a sort of restativo type of air, and there are parts of it which are much more likely have been scored with violins where perhaps in a bass aria or a bass air, we should say, like in a Lully score, you have bass sung and the two violins are two sort of descant voices above it. And that's pretty clear that you would encounter that in the Couperin score. And then I think probably the other thing I'd mention is you have to make sure that these violin parts are very vocal in character. A short while ago, I did some work on parody settings of um, Couperin. And uh, there are parody settings of Lully overtures. So imagine a Lully overture with words. And Ballard published a lot of these in the 1720s, just the bass and the dessus. And it shows you just how closely they align the instrumental idiom with the vocal. So I took great care to make my instrumental parts vocal in character, to the extent that almost always I know what words could be set to these lines, so they speak. And uh, I hope that makes a difference, that those lines have a vocal character. I'm sure it's essential that they do. Well, we're very much looking forward to hearing these uh, motets in Montreal. Well, we were greatly looking forward to performing them. This is actually a second edition. I, um, Montreal will receive the first performance of this new edition I've made because I've had the great pleasure of reworking them to some extent um, and reconsidering some of the decisions I've made, which has been a fascinating process. So um, I'm looking forward to the chance of giving these newly revised workings their first performance. <laughs> 